Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Holman. I'm the curator at the Hampton History Museum. And uh, welcome to our Port Hampton lecture. Uh, again, tonight, we'll be uh, doing uh, Facebook Live uh, due to restrictions from uh, our COVID-19 protocols. Hopefully soon, we'll invite you back in to join us in person. Uh, but as we are uh, soldiering on in this format, I want to uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Vic Kennedy, our speaker tonight. Dr. Kennedy is a professor emeritus at Chesapeake Bay Biological Laboratory. For 38 years, he's performed ecological research in Chesapeake Bay and taught graduate students at Horn Point Laboratory before joining CBL. He has published numerous scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals on invertebrate and fish biology. Uh, Dr. Kennedy seeks to understand and describe the environmental history of Chesapeake Bay so that readers can appreciate how resource-rich the bay, the bay was when Europeans arrived and how it has been over-exploited uh, since the 19th century. And I spoke earlier with Dr. Kennedy about that is a, a topic we do deal with directly here uh, in the History Museum, and I'm excited to hear what he has to say and can educate me so that I might pass it along to our visitors. Uh, to that end, he has written uh, Shifting Baselines in the Chesapeake Bay, published by uh, John Hopkins University Press in 2018 uh, to describe these findings. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kennedy here in just a second. I do want you to understand uh, that we'll, we'll uh, make some time at the end of the, of the presentation for some questions. So if you don't mind, post those questions in the comment section and we'll get to them as soon as uh, Dr. Kennedy uh, finishes up the presentation. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here to talk about uh, some historical uh, aspects of Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the world. Uh, it's a, a region in which uh, fresh water, it's a very rich uh, part of the, of the world, it's shallow and uh, can be very productive. And it was very productive in the past. Before Europeans arrived in uh, Chesapeake Bay, uh, North American Indians were making use of the bay uh, to a great extent. You see this uh, 400 plus year old drawing that has uh, shows some of the fishing activities of uh, Native Americans back at that time in the 1500s. You see that they um, would be fishing with spears. They had weirs in which fish became trapped. They had nets. This man might be using an oyster uh, rake. It's not quite uh, clear what it is, but this was a very rich habitat in terms of fishery resources. The colonists uh, who wrote about it mentioned uh, about the large and abundant fish and the water seemed to be very clear with abundant sea grasses. And to illustrate that, if you look here in the bottom, you see these two um, horseshoe crabs. Over here is a cow nose ray. Those two uh, creatures are bottom dwelling creatures. And so the implication is that if they're in this picture, they could have been seen by the illustrator through the water. Uh, at the present time, the waters tend to be murkier uh, than they were back then. The number of people living in the uh, region and the number of North American Indians was quite low in these tidewater settlements. So they were not uh, making much of an effect on the resources, uh, I would imagine. The Chesapeake Bay was described by H.L. Mencken a uh, Baltimore Sun reporter in his autobiography in 1940 that Baltimore, he said, lay near the immense protein factory of Chesapeake Bay and out of the bay it ate divinely. And so it was an immense protein factory supporting uh, all of these fishery resources. Back in 1877, a writer called McKay Laffin wrote about a plain winter dinner in Maryland. It included four small Linhaven oysters, which would have been uh, captured in Virginia's portion of Chesapeake Bay. It would also include terrapin a la Maryland, roasted canvas back ducks, a small salad of blue crab and lettuce, and a variety of other foods. So this was quite a feast. It was a winter uh, dinner, so shad, which was common that time in the spring, was absent. So this was a, a winter dinner in Maryland, and probably the same thing would have been true for people uh, living in Virginia. So I'm going to be talk about talk about the um, some of the organisms that uh, supported that uh, plain winter uh, dinner. Uh, 
A quick look at the start, a few slides that show historical records of landings and the early histories of some of the bay fisheries. Then I'll spend a little time talking about the details of two very important fisheries, economically very important in the 18, late 1800s, uh, when Chesapeake Bay, Maryland and Virginia supported uh, the greatest oyster fishery in terms of uh, landings and in, um, um, income in the world. And the same thing is true for shad and river herring um, that were in great abundance. And then I will summarize by talking about restoration efforts to restore some of these populations. So just a quick look at these uh, diagrams here showing the uh, fish landings or harvest. A landing is the, the harvest, the amount of uh, material that was uh, brought onto the um, dock by the fishing people. Uh, we have shad and river herring uh, at the top and the landings are in millions of pounds, then terrapins and sturgeon in the middle and oysters, in this case, it's Maryland's oyster catch in the bottom. And you see it's, all of these start around the 1800s, 1875 for these two fish and for the terrapin and sturgeon and even earlier for oysters. And what you see is that in the 1800, late 1800s, there was a very a large catch at the time and then it de declined for shad. Uh, it stayed um, at a reasonable level for a period of time for river herring and then declined terrapins sturgeon declining and oysters as well. So this was kind of the pattern, a tremendous resource being exploited in the 1880s and 90s and early 20th century, and then it declined to the present time. So an early account of oysters in Virginia. Uh, Francis Louis Michel, a Swiss visitor to uh, Virginia in 1701 wrote that the abundance of oysters is incredible and it, uh, apparently at low tide, they um, extended up to the surface of the water to the point where they were a navigational hazard. And this cartoon shows a small uh, vessel apparently stuck on an oyster bar. And in the foreground here, we have Indians um, in the inshore uh, wading out to collect oysters. And Michel pointed out that oysters were very large. Uh, he had to cut them in two before he could eat them. This shows the uh, landings again of the uh, Chesapeake Bay oysters, uh, Virginia landings and Maryland landings. Uh, we don't have all the data for the early years from 1875 on. That's why you only have scattered bars here. And then starting with 1830, there were annual harvests. So you see that there's a large landings in both um, uh, states back in the late 1800s. And gradually then a decline to the present time. And uh, notice that dermo and MSX are mentioned here. Those are two oyster diseases uh, that had a negative effect on the uh, oysters in addition to some of the other problems caused by fishing. Now let's move on to early statements about American shad. This is a, an account by a man called Gilbert Fowler who uh, wrote this when he was about 75 or 80, talking about a shad fishery in the Susquehanna River up near Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania back when he was a young man in the early 1800s. And he said that you could stand on the banks of a river where seine fishing took place, and you could see shad schools coming up the river from Don River. And they came in such a number that they produced a bow wave. The, the number and the intensity of their swimming upstream to spawn uh, caused uh, the, the bow wave to extend uh, from shore to shore. That's a tremendous number of fish to do something like that. Again, uh, a graph showing the landings of the shad at, uh, back uh, starting in 1880. You see again the peak and the decline. And Virginia and Maryland uh, are in different colors. Shad, as I'll explain uh, in a few moments, would come into Chesapeake Bay and obviously they'd start off in Virginia waters. And so the Virginians had first crack at them. And then what was left went up into Maryland and Maryland tributaries and the catches in Maryland were smaller because of the, of the harvest that had happened in Virginia. Moving on to sturgeon, John Smith, early explorer, wrote about uh, in the 1600s. He said that uh, there were some reports of 52 sturgeon taken at a draft and another 68. A draft would have been a, a, a seine load, pulling a beet seine onto the beets and the sturgeon being captured in that. He says in four or five hours, you could take seven or eight sturgeon. And by 1609, he said, there was plenty of food for the colonists 
because of the amount of sturgeon that was in the neighborhood. And of course, we know that that is no longer the case. You see that in this figure down here uh, of the landings. Going back to Mackay Laffin, the man who wrote the plain winter dinner in Maryland, he was uh, writing also a diamondback terrapin. And he had this statement that people who were living on the uh, Eastern Peninsula, and this was in uh, um, the Eastern Shore, reported that back in warm, uh, earlier days during the warmth of the uh, summer, let's say, terrapins, like most turtles, would uh, crawl out uh, of the water onto a branch or a, a something to uh, sit in the sun. And there were so many back in those days that they could be caught in seines and fed to pigs. And as Laffin said, this was something in the past, and this art and valuable article of food is perhaps in trouble. Finally, looking at water, wintering waterfowl, remember that waterfowl in Chesapeake Bay are very abundant in winter because they've moved down here from where they, from their um, uh, breeding grounds up in Canada. And uh, there are two men who uh, were Dutchmen who came over to the Maryland region uh, to look into uh, founding a church. There were ministers looked to, into founding a church in their particular denomination, and they uh, would be riding back and forth uh, uh, along the areas. And they reported that as they were riding along, they would stir up the waterfowl uh, that were offshore in the embayments and so on. Uh, and uh, these waterfowl were so abundant that they made this vibration like a great uh, storm coming through the trees. And then a little later in 1686, uh, Thomas Glover wrote that in the wintertime, uh, th there were so many wildfowl that they might cover the water for two miles. And we don't see those sorts of uh, multitudes of waterfowl uh, anymore at this time. And one of the reasons for the waterfowl being um, decimated was that at one time, 100 more years ago, market hunters could go out and shoot uh, ducks and, and uh, geese and swans and bring them into town and sell them to grocers or to, uh, to um, well, send uh, and, and, and grocers. And uh, the, here we have two guns that um, Dr. John Walsh um, had, had in his collection, and these are punt guns, and they were attached to um, boats, and they were stuffed with gunpowder and shot, and then uh, attached to a, a boat, and at night, the um, uh, hunter would go out, sneak up on ducks that were uh, 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 sleeping on the water, and would uh, discharge these guns and would kill uh, up to 100 or 200 ducks at a time. Same with the battery guns that you see on the right-hand side. Okay, so that's a, a quick overview as to what uh, was going on with those uh, creatures. Let's look now at the oyster fishery in a little more detail. First of all, these are some 1881 diagrams of the oyster gear that was used back in those days. Uh, dredges were panned by, uh, powered by hand. They were um, used by these people. The gentleman on the right nowadays would probably be collecting Social Security. There were two dredges on the uh, these uh, sailboats, uh, one on each side. This man bent over is also uh, ha having a hand winch and he's operating this dredge um, on the left-hand side of the picture. There were shaft tongs, just as there are today, that could harvest a, a number of bushels depending on the depth. The deeper uh, the, the depth, the more, the longer the tong shaft had to be, and you collected fewer bushels that way. And then there were mechanical tongs that were developed later, which were more efficient. But it was a lot of these tools for oystering uh, are the same today, except they're mechanized. So let's take this a look at this interesting 1881 illustration that appears, interestingly enough, in a book in Germany, in, in, Lex, in um, Leipzig, published in 1881, about Tally's Point Reef in Chesapeake Bay, which is off Annapolis. Now, in this, you see all of these oyster tongers in their boats with their tongs. In the background, you see sailboats that are um, dredgers. And the thing about this, I put these rectangles in to show that 
these men went out to do this tonguing in a sailboat. This was before internal combustion engines were developed to motor out to the, to the bars. So they would sail out to the bars uh, and then do their tonguing. And also in 1880, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper of the time reported that as many as 100 boats could be seen on this particular reef. Each of them was eight, capable of taking 30 bushes, which was probably the amount that they were allowed to take each day, or 450,000 oysters a day from this reef. Now, if you take that uh, 30 bushels in 100 boats, that's 3,000 bushels. And uh, Frank Leslie says those 3,000 bushels contain 450,000 oysters. That works out to an average of 150 oysters in a bushel. Nowadays, uh, 250 to 300 oysters are required to make up a bushel of the same size as back 100 or more years ago, which tells you that today's oysters are much smaller than the oysters that used to be taken off Tally's Point Reef or other parts of the bay uh, in the 1880s. And we'll also use this information in another way to compare the harvest from that one reef to Maryland's most recent harvest a couple of years ago. So going back to 1881, you have 100 boats, 30 bushels, that's 3,000 bushels a day. Uh, six harvest days a week, you, you did not harvest on Sunday, but you could harvest the other six days. That meant you could have, from Tally's Point Reef, 18,000 bushels harvested every week. The harvest season was roughly about seven months or 28 weeks long. So if you take 28 weeks multiplied by 18,000 bushels a week, that leaves you estimating about half a million bushels were being harvested in 1881 from Tally's Point. Now, let's assume that they couldn't get out there every day or there were some other factors that um, caused them not to be harvesting half a million. Let's cut it down to 252,000 bushels, a quarter of a million bushels on this one oyster bar off Annapolis. In 2017-2018, the amount of bushels harvested from all of Maryland's oyster bars together was 180,000. So you see fewer oysters are being landed in Maryland uh, that year, 2017, 2018, than had been landed uh, back in 1881 from one oyster bar. Gives you some idea of the change that has taken place. And of course, this harvesting was being done from uh, dredge boats and from tong boats, as I showed you, uh, under sail. This is a um, a postcard of a picture of oyster dredge boats in Baltimore Harbor back around 1900. You can see how many there were in the harbor. And here in Cambridge Creek, a, a smaller town uh, halfway down the bay uh, at 1900, the same sort of a thing, uh, these sailboats that uh, people would go out and harvest from. And this picture here is an aerial view taken around 19, uh, the late 1930s. And this is a view of dredgers, sailboat dredgers, skipjacks with one mast and bug eyes with two masts. And they were dredging near Tillman Island, which is about uh, a third of the way down um, the bay below uh, Baltimore. You don't see that anymore because there, there, there were at one time 1,700 uh, dredging boats in Maryland. And uh, now there are maybe about a dozen left and uh, I don't think any are dredging for oysters. The Bay's oyster industry, both in Maryland and in Virginia, was huge in the late 1800s. And uh, there were a number of reports that were written about that, and I've taken some pictures from them. On the left-hand side, you see uh, white uh, oyster shuckers, male, male and female, working at uh, that shore. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, black oyster shuckers also working away at shucking. And down below in this picture, we see a number of cans of oysters that were available for sale, uh, pint cans all the way up to gallon cans. And this is, these are basically oysters that were harvested in the Patuxent River, which is just above the Potomac River in Maryland. And you will notice that one of the cans uh, has the French word huitre uh, for oysters. And that can, that, those cans were probably going to be sent to Canada and to uh, this particularly to Quebec province. So it was an international trade. Here are some more pictures from the uh, 1890s showing uh, processing rooms in Baltimore's oyster canneries. Uh, above, I point out that 20 million bushels were harvested in 1885 in Maryland and Virginia. Remember in Maryland, uh, just a couple of years ago, it's down to 180 some odd. Uh, 
There were 26,000 people fishing and processing in those uh, two states, 5,700 boats. Here we see the processing rooms. On the left-hand side, you have the people that were involved with shucking or moving shell around. These real cars uh, would come from the uh, dock. They would have been filled with oysters, brought up uh, into the uh, processing room, uh, oysters taken out and distributed so people could shuck them, and then the shell would be collected and dumped in shell piles outside the, um, the uh, shucking house. On the right-hand side, you see them in the, uh, involved with canning the shucked oyster meat. And uh, estimated stock of uh, oysters in the 1880s in Maryland was 400 million pounds. And in 2007, it's about 1% of that. And so the great change has taken place. Canning was a year-round industry, and, and Baltimore uh, was one of the major uh, canning areas in the state, uh, just as uh, Hampton was involved with canning in uh, Virginia. So here we have William Redding and Company uh, that canned uh, oysters, and they also canned fruits, meats, and peaches, strawberries, and raspberries. Now, the advantage of this was that the uh, fruits and um, Vegetables would be canned in the spring, summer, early fall, and then oystering would start in the early fall through uh, into the uh, early spring. And so there was a, a trade-off in the kind of uh, activity, but you still were using the same equipment and facility for canning these different, um, these different foods. The oyster packers used uh, colorful trade cards to advertise their wares. This is from a Smithsonian exhibit of a couple of years ago that was talking about stories from Maritime America. So they show you these various um, trade cards. And I'm going to show you this one here on the left. This is uh, to show how oysters were shipped in different uh, around the country. This is D.D. Mallory and Company, their diamond brand oysters. This, uh, this was their card from Baltimore. And here we see uh, an ad from... Um, Detroit, Michigan, selling Mallory & Company diamond brand fresh oysters. And I've got here on this map the dot on the, Maryland, on the Michigan uh, state as to where that would be located. Then there's a picture from that same Smithsonian show that I told you about earlier. Uh, here in uh, Mankato, Minnesota in 1881 in this meat market, uh, they're selling oysters. And that's where this dot is here uh, on the map. And then finally, we see St. Louis, Missouri in the 1870s, uh, uh, Tony Faust Oyster House and Saloon. Back in the days before television and other distractions, people um, basically would go out to um, oyster uh, saloons, oyster houses, and enjoy an evening um, out, out in the town. And you see where that uh, is in St. Louis. Now, not all of these oysters were coming from Maryland or Virginia. Of course, they might be coming from Connecticut or New York. But ultimately, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey over-harvested their, their um, resources, and so the attention shifted to Chesapeake Bay. So this increased demand led to an increased harvest, and you see this catch on a skipjack uh, back in 1912. Again, dredges on both sides of the vessel. And by now, we were, of course, moving away from uh, uh, manpower to um, uh, some sort of a mechanical power. They had uh, engines that would uh, pull these dredges on board. But there were uh, good catches back in 1912, even though it was fewer than had been 30 years earlier. So Dr. Elizabeth uh, North uh, of the University of Maryland put together this using Department of Natural Resources data looking at the cause and effects of the declining oyster populations. Why did they drop? So in the left-hand column, we see 150 years ago, there might have been 14 million bushels of oysters landed on average. A lot, a lot of people and boats were in, involved, uh, 80 processing companies at least, and the uh, suitable habitat in Maryland was a third of a million acres. Then there was overfishing and habitat destruction, and I'll tell you what the destruction is in a moment. But that meant that about 50 years ago, 100 years after uh, this left column, we're down to a smaller number of bushels being harvested, fewer people involved in it, fewer companies working there, and the habitat has declined, the suitable habitat has declined. And then finally, continuing overfishing and habitat destruction 
was accompanied by disease. Remember I mentioned Dermo and MSX in the earlier uh, landings um, graph. Those two diseases had a negative effect on the uh, oysters in the bay as well. And so now we're down to less than uh, half a million bushels uh, capable of being harvested, a lot fewer people and processing companies, and the suitable habitat has declined a great deal. So the, the picture here that you see here is of a healthy reef back in, in 1931. This would have been a reef uh, that you might have seen in the 1880s, 1890s, all the way through to 1930s. You see that you, you can see the oysters and um, the habitat. There's not much in the way of sediment there. But here in 2005 is a photograph showing a reef smothered by silt. Now, what was going on was that as the oysters were being harvested, the reef profile was being dropped closer and closer to the bottom. The oysters were being taken away and they were not recovering. And so as you move closer to the bottom, uh, the currents were not washing sediment away from the oysters to the same extent they might have been if the oysters had been in reefs poking up towards the surface of the, of the bay. And the second thing was, of course, with development on land, clearing land for... Um, uh, various developments, industrial or um, people living developments, uh, you would have runoff from the, um, from the land and you'd have the sediment piling up. And so back in 1921, they were concerned about this habitat destruction. They recognized that it was going on, especially the loss of this settlement material. This is oyster shell, oyster larvae, the baby oysters swimming around for a while, and I'll show you pictures of them, like to settle on oyster shell. And so the question being asked by Reginald Truett a hundred years ago was, this is a shell pile, he says, what's it gonna be? Roads, chicken grit, or material for oyster restoration? Back in those days, a hundred years ago, uh, roads were mostly dirt roads and became muddy when it rained. And so farmers and the state might take oyster shell and spread it on the dirt roads to harden it up. Also, the broiler industry was starting up and chickens were being uh, grown in greater numbers and you need chicken grit for their um, uh, eating acti activities. And so oyster shell would be ground down to very small particles and sold to um, the uh, chicken growers. And so this was material that could either be sold by the processor who had shucked this, the oysters and, and uh, amassed the shell. They could either sell it to people for road uh, use or for chicken grit. And um, the state wanted them to put it back uh, on the bottom because once you take that uh, shell away from the bottom, there's uh, less uh, place for the oyster larvae to settle. So they put in some taxes, uh, shell taxes, I'll talk about in a minute. Here are two postcards from Hampton, Virginia. And you see two, uh, over 200,000 bushels of shell that had piled up uh, outside a couple of uh, oyster processing facilities. The men on this will give you some idea of the size of this. Uh, and the shell would be run up on this conveyor belt and dumped uh, on that. And you see how much shell was being harvested uh, in around 1900. So this cartoon put together by Dr. North uh, shows uh, uh, the changes that took place in time in Maryland. And this would be reflected also in Virginia, uh, slightly different uh, details, but the same pattern. So after uh, the early 1800s, after the Civil War, the demand for oysters increased and the, the landings in Maryland and also in Virginia peaked around the 1880s. So there was an oyster survey, but one of the key things that happened to affect the industry was that the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad expanded westward. And so Baltimore with its canneries and um, the people in Hampton, if they could get their oysters up towards the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, could ship them westward uh, out to uh, Minnesota and um, uh, Missouri and uh, uh, the West Coast and then up to Canada. So that was important. But after that, you see that this early overharvesting, the uh, abundance dropped. There were every peri periodically in Maryland, every decade or so, there was a conservation commission looking into why this was happening. Then they would make recommendations and the politicians would ignore them. Uh, they had a, a survey of natural bars by Yates back in the early days. And Virginia was a uh, uh, bailer who did a similar survey. And Maryland introduced a 10% shell tax to try and get shell back on the bottom. A little later, uh, there was a bit of stability for a few, a few couple of uh, decades. 
the shell tax went up to 50 percent. The uh, processors didn't like it at all. Eventually, it stopped. And so Maryland and I, maybe Virginia, I'm not sure, introduced the shell dredging program where they went and they d uh, dug up shell from old oyster beds that had been overwhelmed by sediment. And they put that shell, which is called fossil shell, not really fossils, um, done in a repletion program, trying to build the bottom back up so that um, larvae would have something to settle on. Here are the disease outbreaks that I mentioned, uh, Dermo and MSX, uh, that also hammered the industry in addition to uh, uh, the loss of the habitat. And this is a decline in, in uh, the oyster fishery. So let's turn our attention now to a fish. And we'll look at shad and river herring. Uh, this is a shad. And down here are two river herring, alewife and blueback. The three of these are plankton feeding fish. And they, as adults, live out in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, feeding in the wintertime down in warmer waters, and then in the spring, migrating up along the East Coast to the Bay of Fundy, where they feed in the summer. But part of this migration is not just a feeding migration, it's a spawning migration. And so these uh, shad and river herring, some of them would uh, go into Chesapeake Bay, others into Delaware Bay, up the rivers along the coast, uh, depending upon where they had originally uh, been hatched. So here in Chesapeake Bay, they would sail into Virginia, then Maryland, then up the Susquehanna River, and they could sail as far up as Binghamton, New York, a 500-mile uh, journey from the mouth of the bay. Now, this is a cartoon showing the, the, bi uh, the biology of these creatures so you understand what's going on here. In spring, the adults migrate into the bay, swim up into freshwater rivers and spawn. And then when they finish spawning, they move back out uh, into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. In the summertime, the, the juveniles that have hatched out of the eggs that were spawned in fresher water, they will gradually move down from the river into the estuary and they will uh, feed in there and grow. And then in the fall, they will move out into the um, ocean, joining the adults. And they stay near shore ocean waters until they are sexually mature at three, three to six years, whereupon they'll join the adults moving in there um, uh, on the spawning migration. So looking at some of the early data, in 1832, Joseph, in 1835, Joseph Martin wrote about uh, the catches in the Potomac River in 1832. These were catches that were taken by seines. This is a beach seine. Uh, one end is kept on the land, the net is moved out into the water and brought back to the land, and then the wholesale seine is pulled on shore. And uh, he was talking about the uh, landings, the harvest that landed in the District of Columbia area and in Alexandria. And, he, and the shad season is a short season, shad and river herring. They're only in there for about six weeks. And he said that a, a, a seine haul could capture one haul could capture 4,000 or more shad and about 100 to 300,000 river herring. So therefore, in the six-week shad season, he said that they've landed in the past, in 19, 1832, at over 22 million shad and 750 million river herring. These catches, of course, back this was before um, refrigeration and uh, would uh, take too much ice to, to uh, keep these from spoiling, so they salted them. And so that required an estimated 995,000 bushels of salt and the similar number of barrels. And this meant that there were thousands of people in this short uh, shad season that were employed either as saners or as processors, in other words, gutting the fish and, um, and salting them, people making barrels and all the rest of this. So there were thousands of people employed for this period of time. Now, these were very large numbers. And but 40 or 50 years later, uh, the U.S. Fish Commissioner said that there are people who are questioning the numbers that Martin was uh, had, had reported. But uh, Commissioner Baird said if there was just half as many uh, fish landed as uh, Martin said, it would still be a huge number of fish. And certainly nowadays, um, we don't see any. There's nothing like that. Okay, moving back then to this graph that shows uh, the catch of the. Um, uh, shad in Virginia, in the light bars, and in Maryland. Remember that the shad are coming into the bay, and they're being um, 
in Virginia waters first and then Maryland waters, two kinds of nets in addition to the beach seine, there were two kinds of nets that were fished in uh, these states, pound nets, I'll show you a picture of them in a moment, and gill nets. Virginia had 2,000 pound nets and uh, almost 17,000 gill nets deployed in 1915. Maryland uh, being further up the bay, fewer fish coming that way. They had fewer pound and gill nets, but still you have but 3,000 pound nets and about 20,000 gill nets um, ready to capture these shad as they moved into the bay and up into the tributaries. So let's first look at a pond net. They would be deployed all along the shorelines in um, uh, uh, the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, there's a leader that goes on to the shore. You can see that often this photograph going up to the shore. Fish swim along, come up to this leader, and they, they obviously don't turn and go onto the shore. They go on into deeper water and they get caught in whatever um, chambers there are in the pound net. And then this is a pond itself where they eventually end up and they're dipped out by uh, the fishers in the area. And so remember, there's about um, uh, three or 4,000 of these all up and down the coastline of the bay. Gill nets, gill nets are basically mesh nets that um, fish swim into and they swim through with their head their gills are flared and they can't back out because they get caught uh, in the mesh of the netting. So here is a, in the Susquehanna River, uh, night gill netting was uh, the way to do it. You set a, a, a lantern that was anchored to the bottom at, and that's where the gill net begins. And you have a couple of people that roll you out into the river. And here's another lantern that you attach at the um, middle of the river at the other end of the net. And then you roll back to the beginning and you pick the net up and you pull the fish out uh, and you keep doing that uh, all night long. And then here I talked about the beach seines. We're moving back to the largest seine in the world that was deployed at Stony Point, Virginia in the late 1800s. Uh, this was a net that the net itself, the mesh part, uh, was about two miles long. It had uh, two ropes, one at each end, so on each of these ropes would be um, another two miles. So there was this tremendous sweep of the seine. You would have one end attached and held on the shore. You would row it out into the river, middle of the river, make a semicircle, come back onto shore, and then you would um, haul it in with a steam engine and as many as 80 men uh, working on this thing, because part of the thing you had to do was keep the bottom part of the net down on the on the bottom so the fish couldn't swim under it and keep the upper part with the floats up at the surface so they couldn't swim over it. And so in a sweep in the best days, you could catch up to 3,600 shad and a quarter of a million of alewives or river herring uh, at one time. But unfortunately, by 1905, only 3,000 shad were caught in the whole season, not in a sweep anymore in the whole season, it was no longer economical you can imagine how much it costs to, uh, to hire all of these laborers and all the rest of it and to keep the net in good shape. So the fishery ended at Stony Point, Virginia. Okay, now, a beach seine uh, requires a beach, and it requires a beach uh, that you can haul a seine on without having all sorts of offshore uh, riprap or trees or what have you to catch uh, the net on. It had to be fairly clear of obstructions, in other words. Now, the good... Um, uh, beaches up and down uh, the uh, Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries were generally all taken up because of the in demand for the fishery. Uh, George Washington, as a matter of fact, had a beach seine fishery at Mount Vernon. So uh, in places where they couldn't, in the Susquehanna River, where there were no longer any suitable uh, uh, beaches upon which to pull a seine, um, and let me just say that with regard to a fishery, a beach seine fishery where you could pull your uh, beach seine on shore, if the, fish, if the farmer who owned that beach, that land on uh, approaching the beach, didn't use it for his own use, he would lease it out to somebody else who wanted to use it for uh, seining. And so, as I say, all of the good uh, beaches were taken up. So in this region, what they did is they built shad fishing floats. This is just an astonishing thing. It gives you some idea of how much money you could make uh, and during this six week season. Uh, this is basically a raft. And on this raft, there are uh, a bunkhouse for the many men that were on this, a, a mess hall to feed them and a processing 
placed for the uh, barrels and the um, and the um, saw for processing the fish. And of course, they would uh, go back and forth uh, between the land and the shad float. Here is a shad seine. Here are the ropes. Here is a net. Uh, here are the rowers, and uh, they would row this this net out there to the float, and whatever else was needed, and then they would take back the barrels of processed salted shad and river herring, and this went on, and they, they would uh, live on the um, uh, float uh, for the duration of the fishery. So here we have a, a picture of um, a shad float at Port Deposit, Maryland. This is in 1905, and so here's. Uh, the raft's uh, uh, surface, and this is a slope that uh, this was at an angle with 25 or 30 degrees down into the water that you would use to pull the the um, seine back up onto uh, the float itself. Here are the cork uh, floats on to keep the upper part of the uh, net up in the water, and here are weights that would keep them down. And you see all of these people here were involved in this activity. And they were living uh, in these structures and eating in it during the period of time. This is a picture uh, of another shad float with the hull seine already been hauled in, and you can see how much, how many fish there were. Here are the, uh, here's the seine and its and its um, ropes. They've got these boards here to keep the fish from being from flopping back into the water. A large number of men involved in this activity back in 1905 in these shad floats. So this was an, uh, a remunerative fishery if you could afford to hire all these people and to build this floating raft. So why did the shad and river herring harvest decline? First of all, it was overfishing by these pound nets and gill nets and seines that I've described to you. Also, dams were built on some of these tributaries. They were used to power lumber mills. They were used to power grist mills for grinding uh, grain or they were used to, to uh, provide electricity. And these dams, of course, meant that anything that was going to swim upstream was stopped. And that's what happened with uh, Binghamton. Uh, gradually, there were dams that were built on the Susquehanna that prevented shad from getting up to Binghamton or uh, further up um, uh, down, the, down the Susquehanna River uh, uh, until finally you've got the um, uh, whole river covered with these obstructions. Also, the spawning habitat where the fish might uh, lay their eggs could be polluted by sawdust or chemicals or other material from uh, shore facilities. And uh, also, at, back in those days, they were dredging sand and gravel sometimes from the rivers to um, use in land for uh, land development. So you have um, overfishing and habitat degradation affecting the um, shad and the river herring. So those were basic reasons for the two greatest fisheries in the world, the oyster fishery and the shad fishery uh, declining, along with a lot of other uh, fisheries in the bay. The bay's health, of course, was declining over time. And nowadays, we don't want to continue the status quo. We're trying to restore uh, the, the uh, fisheries. And so there are various ways of doing that. First, looking at oysters, there's the restoration that can be helped by hatchery efforts. And there are hatcheries in Virginia and there are hatcheries in Maryland that are being used to uh, grow uh, oysters for restoration purposes. So you need to uh, have adults that reach, uh, oysters that need to reach adulthood so they can spawn, so they need to survive and grow and live close together in some kind of a reef-like situation so that they can stimulate each other to spawn. And so you can use hatcheries to uh, grow a spat as I show you, larvae and spat uh, to supplement oyster beds. And you also can set aside some oyster beds as sanctuaries, no harvest sanctuaries to allow oysters to, to grow there uh, uh, and reach um, adulthood and, and spawn without being depleted. And if they're developing any sort of resistance to disease, you don't want to be harvesting those oysters that are disease resistant. You want them to stay in the bay so that they can pass on their genes to their offspring. So survival is important, obviously. Most mortality occurs in the larval stage of the uh, eggs and sperm that are uh, put into the um, estuary by the oysters, the adult oysters. 99.99% uh, of them uh, don't survive to settle on the bottom. They're eaten by other creatures or they die for various reasons. 
So the, the larvae in the juvenile stages are uh, the ones that uh, you try to protect. And so hatcheries can provide a head start. Here we see an oyster shell in the left picture. And these little blobs here, these are oyster spat. These are what larvae have settled on the shell. And this is what they look like when they are small and they settled. And then this uh, particular larva, the spat now, is, has been growing a new shell. And so you take, uh, people take advantage of this to uh, uh, help restore oysters. And if you look at um, this website here for the laboratory at, uh, in Cambridge, Maryland, uh, this is similar to what goes on in oyster hatcheries uh, all around the world. Uh, you have brood stock that is brought into the hatchery, let's say in January, and uh, they're getting ready to um, produce sperm and eggs. Uh, and so you put them in, in uh, colder water to keep them from spawning and you feed them and they gradually ripen. And then you take them and put them in these trays. And you don't know which are males and which are females because you can't tell, they all look the same. But you put them in these trays and then you run warmed river water over. And you're doing this, let's say, in March when it's still cold. This warmer water is out of, uh, usually spring temperatures, about um, uh, 20 degrees centigrade, 15 degrees centigrade. And what happens, this stimulates the uh, adult oysters to spawn. And so you can see on the right hand figure here, the males produce sperm and they produce it in this stream a steady stream uh, of this appearance. And then the females will clap their shells together and uh, um, expel their eggs into the water column. Well, when this happens in this tray, you take the females, which you can tell by this um, situation, and you put them in, a, in one container of water and you take the males and you put them in another container of water and you let them spawn for two or three hours or however long this goes on. And then, uh, you take the and mix a little bit of the sperm with the, the eggs. There's not a lot of sperm needed, but you try to and hope that the eggs will become fertilized. And then those eggs that you have are not fertilized. They're uh, zygotes, so they're then becoming larvae swimming in the water. You feed them for two or three weeks, depending upon temperature and the conditions, and you get to a situation where you have uh, the larvae that are ready to settle. And so in this picture here, what you're looking at is under a microscope, all of these little oyster larvae, which are about the size of a sand grain, swimming around. They're concentrated because they're on a, um, a slide. You can see the, the man here is looking through uh, a microscope at something or other, but he would be using a similar microscope to look at these uh, larvae. And they're swimming around, and you can tell when they're about ready to settle. Um, there are some... Uh, um, behavior patterns that indicate that they're ready to settle. And so you want to have shell available for them to settle on. Okay, so what they do over on um, the eastern shore in the lab um, that you see with this uh, URL here, they use oyster spat on shell. So you have the oyster larvae that you saw swimming around. You provide shell for them to settle on. When they settle, they're called spat. And so what happens is there are these aluminum structures that have been built to hold shell. And this is clean shell. Remember the shell piles? This would be shell material that had been shucked and had been washed and cleaned as much as possible and then put into these containers. And these containers would then be putting into circular structures that look like swimming pools. So here we have one of these huge swimming pools. There are 100,000 shells per tank. In other words, 100,000 oyster shells per tank. And this uh, is a, a pail with a larvae that are ready to settle, and it can have one to five million larvae uh, in that pail. And it's added to the water. There's river water being pumped into this system uh, to start with, and then they turn the water off, and then they add this, the larvae, and they let them uh, sit for a couple of days, and the larvae will be swimming around, uh, and when they find shell that they like, they will attach to it. And so that situation means that after a period of time, these containers have oyster shell that now have spat on those shells, uh, maybe dozens and dozens of little larvae that have attached to the shells. And so they are hoisted out of these tanks and emptied into a boat that then carries it out into the river. And the shell is washed over at an appropriate place that people believe that the um, 
uh, the spat will grow. And so this is one way to have restoration taking place. That happens in Virginia as well as in Maryland. Sometimes this can be done, used by people to show conservation groups or politicians uh, uh, how useful this kind of activity is. Here we have some uh, young people with bushel baskets filled with oyster shell that has spat on it, and they're putting it on an oyster uh, reef uh, somewhere uh, in the bay. And then finally, you can have the spat on shell inside these mesh bags. And then with the help of enthusiastic uh, volunteers, uh, you take these mesh bags down to the water and somebody who has um, riverfront property can put those over uh, and the spat can grow to uh, adult oysters on the shell. So that's a way to restore oyster beds. Now, the goals of the oyster restoration, first of all, you want to have sanctuaries, some of the historical reef areas where oysters used to grow. You want to have those as sanctuaries where nobody's allowed to harvest. Uh, that allows the uh, adults that have, are developing disease resistance to survive without being um, uh, harvested and pass their genes on to their offspring. It also allows the adults that are in the sanctuaries to spawn and produce eggs and sperm that float outside the sanctuary and maybe settle on oyster reefs nearby. And this has happened, it's shown in North Carolina, so it's probably happening in Chesapeake Bay as well. And so it builds up these uh, structures that allow for other creatures to live as well. And it supports the self-sustaining fishery uh, in, that, in th that way. Shad and river herring, it's difficult to restore them. They've been trying to do this for a long time. I should have mentioned that uh, you can't capture shad and river herring commercially uh, in the bay. Same thing for terrapin and um, sturgeon. So you can restore by regulating the harvest of adult fish. So that has been done. You either say that you can only harvest a certain amount, or you say you can't harvest any until we've done a better job of restoring it. Obviously, restoring dams will be helpful. Uh, that all depends. We're not going to be able to uh, take the Conowingo Dam uh, in the mouth of the Susquehanna Don, but they're, they're taking down dams that might not be of use anymore for uh, lumber mills or for uh, grist mills. Uh, so they're doing that, for instance, in New England a great deal and restoring rivers from migrating fish, including uh, shad, alewives, and salmon. It's expensive, but it's, it, it works when you get rid of the dams. You can make fish passage facilities. That's what they use to get around the Conowingo Dam. Uh, that's expensive. Uh, and one of the problems is shad don't seem to, to um, make use of fish passage facilities. Alewives are more likely to do so. Uh, you can restock above blockages. So where there's a dam, you can go below the dam, pick up the, the shad or the river herring that are accumulated there at the below the dam, uh, put them into tank trucks and uh, drive them around the dam and let them uh, go in the river up uh, above the dam. That's not cheap. And you can de improve degraded habitat if it's been messed up in some way, uh, but that's very expensive. But there are, these are efforts to restore shad and river herring. Sturgeon restoration is a different story. It's a very lengthy process. Again, dams and degraded spawning habitat is a problem. But the other thing is sturgeon grow very slowly and they take years to mature. So you've got these sturgeon here that might uh, be 20 or 30 years old they start to reproduce uh, when they're 10 or more. And so you can't afford to have a hatchery growing sturgeon uh, to becoming adults. It's just not possible. So the, the restoration is, is taking uh, quite a while and it's and mostly protecting habitat, uh, removing dams and hoping that the fish find each other and, and continue to reproduce. Same thing is true for terrapins. It's a lengthy process for restoring terrapins. Here's a picture from Harper's Weekly of back in 1888. And this is a picture of a terrapin farm. They used to be able to, to farm terrapins uh, when the numbers started to drop and they thought this would be a way to, to bring it back up. Here are two men who are uh, going out and trying to find terrapins by digging a, uh, a pole into the soft bottom. When it bumps up into something hard, they'll excavate it. And if it's terrapin, they'll keep it. And then these terrapins can be reared in a pond that has access through some kind of a conduit from, let's say, the river. And you have to have it, of course, so the terrapins don't escape. But you need to have some kind of a soft 
shore that the females can go on to on the spring summer and um, uh, put their eggs in the sand and then you can protect the eggs in that way and that sometimes works uh, there was a lot of work done for instance in um, North Carolina and Beaufort trying to rear terrapins the problem they ran into is that the terrapins grow very slowly and you have to be rearing them for three or four or five years before they're ready to reproduce they can be very tame if you rattle the food bucket they come running but it, it's uh, it's a lot of work and eventually uh it wasn't worth it economically the other problem that terrapins face face nowadays in, in the bay is that there's a big crab fishery using crab pots and terrapins can crawl into crab pots if there's not some kind of a the structure uh, to prevent them and they can't crawl out and they're, they they breathe air. And so if they're in the crab pots, they can drown. And finally, we're affecting the soft shores and the egg laying habitat that is required for the females to lay their eggs. We're putting riprap on there or we're destroying it. And uh, so there's less egg laying habitat available. There are efforts being made to pr provide that, for instance, um, um, Poplar Island in, in Maryland's uh, Chesapeake Bay is being restored and has a lot of soft sediment uh, beaches, but it's slow. Waterfall restoration is working. This is a cartoon from 1872 that shows the opening of the uh, waterfall harvesting at the time. And you can see that, that was, there were a tremendous number of people out shooting these uh, poor creatures. Eventually they banned market hunting, that whole idea of shooting these um, and, and selling them in grocery stores. Um, Bag limits are in place. This was a bag in 1920. We're not allowed to harvest uh, waterfowl to that extent. And the breeding habitat is protected by such things as Ducks Unlimited, uh, who are helping in the northern parts of the United States and then Canada to protect the uh, their breeding habitat. So that's uh, my story. If you're interested in learning more about this, more details, uh, this is a book I wrote about this that Hopkins Press um, has uh, published a couple of years ago, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I very much appreciate uh, that lesson. As I said, we we, we teach here about uh, a little bit about the uh, the industry that you just described and how it, uh, it declined. Mm -hmm. Of course, part of the storytelling here is how that. Uh, that decline was uh, noted and anticipated, and, and in many ways was, what was, was responsible for uh, the local movers and shakers lowering uh, uh, the NACA here to kind of cover the territory lost by the by the decline. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I believe we are just about out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I do appreciate uh, uh, your presentation, and uh, for folks out there who've joined us tonight, thank you again. Uh, again, on the first Monday of the month, we have our Port Hampton lectures, which will be in this format until we're able to invite you into the building again. On the third Wednesday of the month, we have our, our front porch uh, music series, uh, which will follow the same format once again until uh, we're able to invite you back in to join us in person. So please look for us on those dates on the month and join us again. Thanks again for joining us, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you very much. Are, 